and welcome to Gallifrey's Most Wanted. I'm Ross Aiken. I'm Old Who. Robisha, this is interesting. And I'm Victoria Wheeler. I'm New Who. What are you talk? What is he talking about? And we are taking a little break from Evelyn and Sixy and doing a little adventure with Sixy and one of my favorite comic companions, Frobisher, the shape shifting metamorph, Wifferdil, Wifferil. Um, uh, and we're going to be talking about Big Finish Audio, The Holy Terror. So I'm going to jump to the synopsis from the Big Finish Companion Volume 1, and we'll be right back. The Holy Terror, Big Finish Story 14. Writer, Rob Sherman. Director, Nicholas Pegg. Producers, Jason Hay Gallery, Gary Russell. Released November 2000. Causing the TARDIS to make an emergency landing, Frobisher and the Doctor discover they have arrived just as the newly crowned King Pepin VII is having a crisis of confidence and about to abdicate his, on his coronation day. The arrival of the TARDIS and a big talking bird are seen as a sign of Pepin's divine right to rule and the Doctor and Frobisher are seen as his angels. After meeting scribe Eugene Tacitus, Guard Captain Sejanus and High Priest Clovis, the Doctor discovers that Pepin's illegitimate and hunchback half-brother, Childeric, has been keeping his young son hidden in the depths of the castle since his birth. Childeric is planning to use the child to overthrow Pepin, but not only does the boy truly have godlike powers, he is also psychotic. While Frobisher is made godlike king and tries to rule benevolently, the child becomes out of control and starts to kill people apparently ter- teleporting about the castle. The doctor realizes that the child is not a god and that Tacitus is his real father. After a bloodbath, only the doctor, Frobisher, and Tacitus remain alive, and it is that then the truth is finally revealed. The reason the TARDIS brought them there is because the castle, too, is dimensionally transcendental, and the ship needed an environment similar to its own to effect repairs. The entire scenario is an elaborate prison constructed by and for Tacitus, who has been there for centuries, reliving the same events again and again so that he might try to forget his crime. When the child arrives, the doctor convinces Tatis to admit he murdered his real son while the boy was asleep. Unable to face the guilt any longer, he gives the child a knife, and despite the doctor's efforts to stop it, the child kills him. They both disappear, and the doctor and Frobisher enter the TARDIS, leaving behind them an empty void. All right, I'm going to let Vic go first, because this was her suggestion to take a little pause and do a little Frobisher. Um, well, I like, I really like Frobisher as a character. Yeah. And I will tell you that, uh, I mean, because I've read some of the comics mm-hmm. as well as um, this, and Robert Jessick, who is um, a Canadian actor, uh, uh, was in Battlefield. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just saw him recently, but, um, his Frobisher, um, is the perfect vo- voice of Frobisher in my head. He's got him down as, uh, I, 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 I just love his take. I love, okay. I love who Frobisher is. Uh, at some level, he's, at some level, he sort of rings like the perfect companion because he doesn't say, oh, oh, how does that work, doctor? He says, what, who is this guy? Right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. What is that? He's right? like a like, 40s movie gumshoe kind of guy. Yeah. And I think that's why he, they portray him in the comic bit a little bit like that whenever he pops back up because he does become a problem when he leaves the doctor, he becomes a private investigator. Well, but he's just the perfect, it, it's such a better take, right? Because I, I think about myself as a companion, and the, I'm sure there would be times where I'd want to be all intellectual because I'm me. And so I, I would say, like, well, why does it work that way, Doctor? Right? I would say that. But most of the time, in the heat of the moment, wait a second. What is that? Right? <laughs> it's, it's a lot closer to how how it would work. Yeah. And uh, and so he's he's wonderful. Yeah, he um, is. 
And I agree. I, when I first heard his voice, because when I got this in the mail, because this was when I was still doing the subscription early on in Big uh-huh. Finish, because this is Big Finish 14. Right. I mean, it's early. Yeah. Second year, maybe. Yeah, second year. Um, and I had read the comics, and I and that is an era I like a great deal. It's John Ridgway art. It's Grant Morrison is doing some of the writing, and he was right. an incredibly famous comic writer now. Now, oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. wasn't then. Right. Oh, no, no, no. Everybody got their – Dave Gibbons got to start uh, – I – was at Galaxy Con, and they asked David Tennant was talking about the specials, and he was he geeked out a little bit that beat the Meep mm-hmm. uh, comic characters in it, and his one of the highlights was that Pat Mills, John Wagner, and Dave Gibbons, or the creators were I don't know if John Wagner's still alive, were on set. Oh wow! So. Oh, wow. Which and as we record this, when we're done, I'm going to edit an episode of Comic Shop with Mark, and we've covered Beep the Meep. Yeah. So, uh, because that it's you know, so the comics have an influence. There are certain comic characters that have transcended the comics, and Frobisher and Beep are Frobisher. Two, Frobisher, Frobisher is the number one. Yeah. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Um, I've I've. You know, I've got the action figures, and I see. I'm jealous that some people have found a, a size appropriate penguin toy, <laughs> so they have a Frobisher companion fi- figure. Um, but he's a great character, and I think when I first heard the voice, I went, "Oh crap, that's the perfect voice." I don't. Do we have to say this to people that Dave Gibbons drew Watchmen? Do we have to tell people that? Um, I think maybe, I don't know. To us who have enough comic knowledge, who've read comics, you, you know it. Right. But I mean, Alan Moore is so synonymous with it. Do people know that he didn't draw it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they do. It's, it's a, it's a Watchman Gibbons thing. Cause even if you're Alan Moore, Alan Moore has certain artist, artist partners that he he uses like Kevin O'Neill, um, uh, Chris Sprouse, Dave Gibbons, and, Mm -hmm. When you say Watchmen, it's more Gibbons. When you say League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, it's O'Neill. Uh, more right. O'Neill. When you say From Hell, it's more O'Neill. When you see ABC, it's, you know, he did ABC for, a, he had like three titles, and it's Gene Ha or Chris Sprouse or J.M. Williams. So he is, because he's such a big promoter, or David Lloyd, who did a lot of Doctor Who. Not David Lloyd, Steve Lloyd, who did a lot of Doctor Who comics early on, mm-hmm. who we lost this past year, did V for Vendetta. So it's more, yeah, right. you, you remember the artist with more. If you if you know your comics, I mean, a lot of people may not have read the comics. You know, it's not everybody has. You know, I turned you, you know, you I got you to read some comics and you read some of the Doctor Who stuff I have. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and I've, I've read uh, collections of... Um, I've read collections of the Doctor Who magazine comics yeah. as well. Yeah. So um, I don't have the big trades for all of Collins' era. I wish I did. Um, yeah, so the art, the first art for Frobisher was John Ridgway. Yeah, that's, he's the guy I like. He also did a lot of, he did a lot of 6 and a lot of 7 mm-hmm. um, during this era when Morrison and Alan Moore and others were coming up and were getting to fiddle around in Doctor Who magazine while it was still a Marvel property. This is right. before what uh, in comic the comic book version of the British invasion. Right. It is right before So so Frobisher appears in first appeared in Doctor Who magazine eighty eight through eighty nine in a story called The Shapeshifter, written by Steve Parkhouse. And um, at that point he was a private investigator calling himself Avon Tarklu, <clears throat> which is a play on the phrase Aventar Clue. <laughs> right? So it's Aventar Clue. Um, but when the person he was chasing puts a bounty out on the dock, you know, he um, infiltrates a TARDIS and, and then decides, rather than turning him in for the bounty, he decides that he's going to hang out with. <clears throat> He's going to ha- um, hang out with the doctor. But then at that point, Cho tra- changes his name to Frobisher because he felt like that sounded British and thought the doctor would like it. <laughs> so <laughs> he's like, I haven't a clue. Um, I haven't a clue. 
so, um, okay, so we've established. I, I love the character. I love uh, the voice actor. Um, this Holy Terror is a farce. It's a classic farce. Yeah. And I, that's not a, um, it's not my favorite genre. Like, I don't always enjoy, um, I don't always enjoy farce. I think the French farces are the best. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I tend not to like British farces. And so um, I have a difficult time uh, with this story. I like the comedy aspect of it. Okay. And in saying that, I will say that the um, some of the best comic elements are um, uh Roberta Taylor's take on Berengaria, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, she is um, the character's funny. She's evil and unapologetically evil, and is uh, shaming of her children who aren't evil. Right? Like she's and she's pitch perfect. Um, yeah. the, you know, uh, Pepin the sixth is purity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and he is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just Eugene Tacitus is the, you know, is the Tacitus, right? Is the historian is the, um, and Where there's comedy, I fully enjoy this. Um, the extreme um, zeal of the people who follow the system and don't question it um, is uh, not funny to me. And again, like we've talked about this, mm -hmm. art and uh, hits differently depending on your time in life, right? Yeah, and there yeah. are people who are zealously following idiocy right now and I so I don't find it funny but I tend not to like I tend not to enjoy farce very very much I mean the, the one that like the original French Lacage uh, full uh, is perfect farce but even Shakespearean farce I'm not a huge fan of and so this one um was very uneven for me because there were some great elements of it and some of the pure comedy of this particularly around Frobisher becoming a god, right? Like, that's Fixing his nose funny. so the sculptor, I like the fact yeah. that the sculptor draw, sculpts him wrong, and he goes, I got it. He fixes his it. nose. He fixes his and, nose, yeah. It's great. Because he doesn't want... He doesn't want to be a god. He doesn't want to be a god. He doesn't want people to get hurt or die or anything because of him. Like, um, so he'll do it. He even changes his face shape. Just come on. Let's just stop with the killing. Right. And he's he's great in it. And and there's a like I said, there's a couple of characters like the Berengaria character is just note perfect on um, making fun of like the evil stepmother sort of character. It It's so it's really tightly written. And really, um, but the background story of this is um and the evil of the hidden child and the, like it's it just it lands wrong but i really think this is one that is a for me i'm this has nothing to do with the i don't think it has to do with the writing i really don't it's that i don't care for this form yeah. And that's that's just me. I, I it like I had problems with, uh, with a Merry Wives of Windsor, um, production that I went and saw that had um Pat um Pat Carroll, the amazing Pat Carroll, the amazing Pat Carroll, um playing Falstaff. Yeah. And I saw it, and it just farce makes me physically uncomfortable. So it's not like and I it, get it, that because this not, is a famous and lauded 
seriously lauded production and i was fortunate enough to get to see it and it made me physically uncomfortable there is certain humor that does it i'm not a fan of like seinfeld or the single camera kind of uncomfortable i don't want right. i don't want to watch people be uncomfortable right. right i don't find it funny i don't find laughing at people right lucy you know, lucy does it well lucy did it a lot yeah but i liked lucy lucy was at least you know, I liked her. Character. She was making fun of herself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, she was making fun of herself. And she, no offense to any of the people that worked on Seinfeld or the office mm -hmm. or any of that. You're not Lucy. Right. <laughs> you're not close to Lucy. Right. You're not, you're, you're not even in the same camp. Right. But this one, I what I liked about this one, and I hadn't really, I didn't hit, Farce didn't hit me with it. It hit me more as someone who is a fan of, the Shakespearean tragedies and stuff like that. I mean, I think you're right. It is a farce in that se in that thing, but it was very much a parody of Macbeth slash Richard the um, Third. That that's the world I was pulled into. That's what what clicked in my brain. Like I said, and it starts as a satire of it, and then gets darker and darker because of the child and that this man has created this world to punish himself, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I had forgotten about that part. This is a little more of that kind of science fiction horror mm -hmm. kind of the way of telling it, a it story. I think it, that. that's, that's, that's why it works for me is because I see it more of that kind of imaginative science fiction story. So, well, I, I mean, I, one of the, one of the, critical elements of farce is that the, the the plot toys with what should be done what is proper and any rebellion against that code right and yeah, yeah. all and that's what this and it really does it well yeah oh no right? i agree with i'm just, and didn't, just I, I, high I, comedy I, moments it's yeah. great it's the witty approach to these things that that sort of makes it a farce um but um so there's, there is a social satire element of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then it turns dark. It really turns dark. It turns really dark, but the kid, the child keeps this, I want to kill. There's almost a comedy edge to the voice the first time he says it. Yeah. And then he continues to say it, and it's not funny. funny. And, yeah. Right? Like, yeah, and, it's, and, it, and it's I think kind, he wants that. Yeah, it's supposed to be creepy. It's supposed to be like, are you my mommy? Something innocuous right? or silly, and then it's not silly. And, right. um, and I think that they give uh, the actor playing Furbisher, Robert Jezik. Jezik, the comedy stuff, and they give Colin the heavy stuff, and they run yeah. parallel. And I like that structurally in Sherman's script, that the six doctors like, no, that's, this isn't cute. This isn't kitschy. What's going on? This isn't funny. What is going? He wants to know. He senses a dark, dark undercurrent. The why these people are doing this. Um, and and when the others rebel against, like when the villain, the villain of the piece goes, take me with you. I want out of this vicious circle. Right. I mean, you know the characters in the play understand right. that they're in the play. That they're following rules. They understand yeah. that everything's a rule. Yeah. Um, like when every time someone gets killed, you have to give the person who kills them a coin. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, when they when Frobisher stops someone from be killing the guy who was supposed to, well, what about my coin? You know. Um, and the societal, you know. So I liked it more as a kind of a horror story. I mean, it starts out funny, and I had, you know, it's been years since I've listened to this one, and I had, like, you know, okay, I remember I really, really liked it, and I still really like it. I like Frobisher. Yeah, but I mean, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, I get you, but I never got the farce part. I got more of the Shakespeare. Well, but yeah. it's, but, but it's I got too, more the, it's too witty and mannered. For a tragedy. Well, yeah, but I thought it was making more fun on it. The, uh, the humor I thought they were going, they were satiring these overly, you know, how the tragedies are like overly violent and 
weird things that would never really happen happen in them. You know, the you know, because Shakespeare even in his his tragedies has you know people in secret. You know, you don't know what's really going on and stuff. Right. Like that. So, but, but like that, but yeah, that's the how seven it. elements of farce are. It revolves around the mistaken or threatened identity of a character. Right? Is he a god or isn't he? Um, attitude towards the plot, it might social codes, it's clue based, it involves funny violence. Um, now it does have a happy ending normally, right? And this one, I can't tell, right? Um, which, I wouldn't, yeah, was, I wouldn't call it a happy ending. I listened no. to this morning at like six Sunday morning and went, ugh. The element of surprise can happen yeah. anywhere and does. Um, and the resolution always includes a sort of comic reversal, um, that's velocity. The speed of it is very fast, and this is very fast, right? Yeah, he's a, a god, then he's not, then he's a god, right? Uh, the multiple and fragile substructures, you know, uh, and it is it is the written guide by which the characters are trapped. So, like, definitionally, this whole, this is, and then the use of character roles. So you have the evil stepmother, the the evil half brother, the right, like the, the prince who doesn't want to be king, he wants to be something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's definitionally a farce, and, and and I, like I said, it's just not my, it's not my thing. I just, but I love, I love Frobisher. I really, the way that this guy handles it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna move Frobisher up in my um, companion list, because even Jamie. <clears throat> you know, even Jamie, who doesn't ask erudite questions, you know, yeah, uh, doesn't get it as right as Frobisher. Yeah. Like, who is this guy? <laughs> I just, I'm so sad that they never did more. Yeah. I, I mean, you, done, you know, uh, if you could do whole, you know, it's maybe the actor is not in England anymore. Maybe he didn't want to, you know, I just, I don't think he's done more any, a lot of big finish after this. Um, they, right, they do the two. Yeah, I would have loved to see more. I mean, and it's with Sixie, I mean, Big Finish has been such a boon to Sixie. Yeah. That, you know, why hasn't there been a Frobisher, more Frobisher? And then Frobisher and Perry travel together in the comics. I'd like that. I think Nicola Bryant, they'd, do a good, they'd be a good threesome in an audio. It'd be fun. Um, I think this one has the feel of the comic strip in a great deal. I could see this being the plot of a Doctor Who weekly comic strip serial. Mm -hmm. Very much so. It's the weird settings because British comics, what I like about them is, you know, at fuck all the setting. It doesn't need to be realistic. It doesn't need to have, it doesn't need to have logical rules. It doesn't need to have things explained to you. It just is what it is. Especially some of those early, especially in Doctor Who magazine, and especially early on like the first, say, hundred issues of the magazine, there's a lot of weird experimentation in storytelling mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and very British comic strippy. And then it becomes basically later on, like, say, after with the Eighth Doctor and on, they're just basically Doctor Who stories told in comic form. Right. You know, they're more closer to the... They stop, go... They, they, they don't try to break the formula as much... Unless they're doing a comedy one, because they'll do those single those single issue comedy stories with different mm -hmm. teams, and that's when they kind of go outside of the norm. But everything else is more straightforward Doctor Who science fiction. So, mm -hmm. and this is very close to the comic strip. Um, and what I like about this one compared to the two comic strips they have adapted, which were Dave, the Dave Gibbon, two of the Dave Gibbon ones, uh, is they didn't adapt something; they created something new. You know, they create, you know, the, with this story, instead of bringing, you know, just adapting Parkhouse and Ridgeway's comic strip, mm -hmm. they brought in Ron, Ch Rob, um, Ch Robert or Roger? Robert. This guy? Robert yeah. Jezik? No, no, the, the writer. I'm brain farting. Oh. Robert Sherman? Yeah. Robert Sherman. Um, they have bring Robert Sherman in to do it. And he does the other one, too, I think. I think he does both Maltese of them. Maltese Penguin? Yeah. yeah. Which is pure comedy. Mm -hmm. He's got Dog Blotter in it, who I like. He's another comic strip character I like. Well, he's from the first Frobisher. Yeah. That's the enemy in the first yeah. Frobisher one. Yeah, and in the Jody comics strips in the Doctor Who magazine, she battles for uh, Dog Blotter's daughter. 
So, okay. um, but you know, I, uh, this one, I really, I, I still enjoyed it a great deal. You know, it is, I forgot how dark it was. So when it turns like an, ep- like an episode three, mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, Oh yeah, this is, this gets really dark. Um, but, but the, the, I think to me, the highlights really are, um, Frobisher and the sixth doctor. I think, I think Colin does some heavy lifting. His acting is very good in it, even though, you know, it's, I think it's more Frobisher's story. Mm-hmm. You know, I think they do, a, it's a good balance because they're separated from most of the story mm-hmm. and they're not in a big chunk of the story after their, their opening scene. We get like almost a whole episode after they, you know, the setup of the the gumble, the fake gumblejack, but which mm-hmm. kind of leads to, you know, to give you an idea, like you've created something and made it, and told the TARDIS to make it think. You've created it's sentient that you shouldn't have done that, and then the TARDIS gets mad at it, them, mm-hmm. and then lands someplace where something similar is happening. Um, because, and I had forgotten the ending a hundred percent, so when. The doctor's going, oh, I think this it's a lot like a TARDIS. I was like, wait a minute, is this dude a Time Lord? I don't remember that. And it's, you know, it's not. It's just something similar. But um, I think it's a tight script. I think it's it gives its actors some good stuff to do, and some of them run with it, and mm-hmm. some are more successful than others. But that's, you know, that's part of collaborative art that, you know, not every, it's not always, not everybody's going to hit the groove. I think the mother is very good. I think yeah. she's very, I think she's funny and a really sad way um i think the sun's kind of funny you know it's a funny part uh but that that end turn you know kind of you know they're all dead you know mm-hmm. no matter what they do um and and the and the dot and the doctor and frobisher are safe you know once they try to kill frobisher and the bullets go right through him because he's not part of this of the fake world you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and that's kind of giving you a clues that this isn't a real place. They haven't landed in a real place. Mm-hmm. So, but, but I, you know, do you remember Maltese Penguin? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, all I remember, it's, it's way heavier satire and it is. Satire I like. like I, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. It's just something. Yeah, I get you. Like I said, every time Frobisher was in my ears, I was happy. Yeah. And, oh. uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Like I said, Berengaria was delicious. She was. She's willing, and she's going to find someone to marry. <laughs> you know, she's just trying to get out of it. Yeah. You know, break the cycle. Because she well, got, you know. She's also ready to die. Right? Like, that's oh. the thing, is that she's ready to just die. Like, this well, is my... Well, that's her job. Yeah, yeah see, that's her, every... It's my yeah. job. And uh, to anybody who is stepping outside of... Right? And then in that way, she's like the, the, you know, the great lady in um, Importance of Being Earnest, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hold to this. You know? I mm. know it's ridiculous. And like I've got one job on this ship, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna do it. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out. Um, no, keep going. Well, I mean, I just it, it, I, I don't have a lot other than I liked it. I mean, it's not there's it wasn't it didn't hit me like like it hit you like oh the real world that you know people listen to and follow stupid rules because they think they should. You know, I think it's worse now, but I think one reason they're parrying it because people are people are sheep. Mm-hmm. You know, people want they don't want to think outside the box sometimes because it's uncomfortable. They just want the box to go away. Mm-hmm. You know, like I just want this to end. This is you know, I'm just I'm a I'm a I'm a mouse in the maze. I'm a hamster in the wheel. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, it made, it made me want more for, for Obersher. That was the big thing because I forgot. Did, I, you know, he is so freaking good. He is so so good, and well, he really and it, nails it. I I looked at it, at his involvement with Big Finish, mm-hmm. and he has sort of three cycles where he did this, and then he came back later and did like a Sarah Jane, right? And then 
and it says his act, active timeline. It, he did made some in 2019 and 2020, as you know, somebody else. He's in like he's in these early ones with Zagreus. He's in Zagreus. He's in one that we just recently listened. There's there's a bunch of them, and uh, 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 so he's. Wait a second. What just happened? Nothing. I see. Oh crap. What happened? No, I just. Did you turn off Audacity? No, 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 no. <laughs> I was just, I was looking at Robert Jessick and it jumped me to something else. Anyway, I am. Um, uh, I um. Yeah, so Jessic is available. Why not make more Frobishers? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, well, maybe Baker doesn't like making them. I don't. I I can't imagine. Maybe it has rights too, because of who owns copyrights on certain things? Right. You know, it's Marvel. Right. They're less. You know, um, you know, the magazine has moved on to other hands. Different people have the rights to repeat. You know, Panini now owns the yeah. right to everything that was ever in Doctor Who Weekly up. Yeah. Maybe they don't want to use their character. You know. Right. And maybe uh, because you know how the old way the old show worked. If you create the bad guy, right, you get the you own the bad guy. You know, right. Sometimes you know the brigadier is not wasn't in stuff because the family of the two people who created the brig don't want him to. So, mm -hmm. so, but you know it's fun. I think it's worth everybody. If you're a big finish fan, it's worth checking out it because you know one of the great things about big finish is they play with the way to tell stories, mm -hmm. and you have that luxury when it's not visual. And it's only audio because you allow the audience to build the world in their head. It yeah, saves so, you a lot on set design. So Jessic did, in the main range, he did Red Dawn, Minuet, and Hell, and Zagreus. Then he did, in special releases, he did one called The Ratings War and a Sarah Jane Smith. And then he did Gallifrey Time War. He did Unity. And at Torchwood, he did Sargasso. Those are recent. So there's a yeah, gap. Yeah, so That's he you. did... There's He's come back. Games. It's yeah. That's he did something in nineteen eighty. He did this one in nineteen eighty nine. Yeah. Yeah. Then he does two thousand to two thousand and three, and then he does twenty nineteen to twenty twenty. Right. So he's. It's not like he's not available to big finish. There must be something, as you say. Yeah. Like the um, like the, the rights. Yeah. But Frobisher is a great character. Yeah. Frobisher is a great character. All of his stuff has been released by Panini finally in collections this oh, yeah. takes place between age of K Voy the voyager and age of chaos which i'd read that they're really good age I of chaos read. just came out um and I me and read. um and me and mark covered the the sequel to mandragona which is a ridge park house ridgeway seventh doctor story recently on the mm -hmm. podcast and it was fun it was fun um it's a really that's a really good comic it's better than the thing it's a sequel to um well i guess that's it that's the end for this one i mean at least sometimes we have little short ones um i got to go to a con yesterday we have a Gal galaxy con which is a co you know a corporate con they do them in like four cities columbus richmond raleigh maybe one other place i don't know um but david Tennant was the guest was a guest and I went to a little panel, and it was very cool. Um, we had to leave early to go get in the queue for a photo. Me and a friend of my wife's, Anna, got a picture with David. Uh, it was very nice, very quick, because there were a lot of us in the corral. Uh, while my wife ran off to see Paul Mark um, Gosler from Saved by the Bell, his panel, because that's her childhood. She was a little kid when that crap was on. Uh... <laughs> And we watched a science fiction show called The Passage that he was in that we both loved, but um, Netflix, Fox canceled it after one season. It was based on a, um, a post-apocalyptic vampire series that I someone recommended. It. I went, ah, I'll, I'll try it because you recommended it, and I loved it. Uh, and he was very good in it. Uh, but she got to do that. And it was a nice little con. I got some autographs from a comic uh, creator. I like Jeff Lemire. It was nice to go to a con. It was incredibly busy. Uh, next year, I think I will go for panels more than wandering around the dealer room because the dealer room is packed. But it was nice to go and see David Tennant. And, get, you know, it had been a while since I got a picture taken with a doctor or a companion. So I now have 
another one to add to the wall. And the one with you, me, and William Russell is not framed because the company that I ordered my special frame, the frames that I like for those photos, um, just I, mean, I didn't get any. So we're going to go up to a framing place and get me a couple and hang them up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got five. Five, six. six. You didn't get seven. No, we were going to get me seven, but we yeah, did that last right. week, Jen. He was going to get it. I got yeah. you and me with Capaldi. Yeah. I've and got you me. didn't get eight because that was also the next. The, yep. the con yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be eight. Yeah. Um, uh, nine hasn't come to the U.S. He's no, he did. He, he, he did. He, he, he did come. He did. He, yeah, he did come. He, he did galley, but now you have ten, and uh, I have ten and, and 14. twelve. <laughs> yeah, ten, four, ten, twelve, fourteen. I don't have twelve. There's, oh yeah, I do have twelve. Duh, I was miscounting twelve. Yes, I do have twelve. And then I have the one with William, and I also have Nick Biggs and Jason Hay Gallery for my yeah. very first thing. Yeah. Uh, which was I pointed. I showed Anna. She had never been in my office. She came by when we were getting ready to go take the bus down to the convention center. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went, see, I've got some of these. And she goes, oh, that's what they're like. You know, she, had, she was very excited. She goes, I'm going to say something stupid. It's like, you're not going to have time enough to say you're something stupid. You're not going to have time. <laughs> These things are boom, boom, boom. And it was 20, 20 foot long lines, you know, in a corral to go see him. And he was after Cleese. John Cleese was there. Um, yeah, it was a good con. I wish, I, I mean, there were more people I'd like to have met. There was no, I'm more the obscure people like the other two times I've gone. I've gotten a picture with Armin Shermerman from Buffy and Deep Space Nine and uh, Jeffrey Coombs from almost every Star Trek and mm -hmm. Reanimator, who is someone I love because he's such a good actor. He can play anything and he is very funny and a very sweet man. So, um, but, oh, and I had the joy of a con is getting to meet people. And in the line next to us was this family from Australia mm -hmm. that are. They're living in America for three years for work, mm -hmm. and we talked about the different ways we digested who in the two different com countries and stuff like that. And I mentioned the podcast. Yes. And as my line was going up to get it to go through the queue, he, he I got I got a couple feet away. He goes, "Hey, your podcast. What's the name of it again?" So hopefully he's listening and he'll reach yeah. out. So hello. But, yeah, you know, we had a good time. I mean, I, that's the best that's thing. That's the best part of cons. No, absolutely. It is meeting someone new and having a conversation. Like minded people. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a good time. And his kids were, you know, they've just, they just gotten here, I think. And they have American Brit Box. So they've just, he started, he started his kids with Tom Baker here. Sure. It's a good one to start with. You it know. is. They're little. So they were little. They were like maybe seven and five. Yeah. So you really, you know, I don't think black and white, you know. Um, yeah. So, but it was fun. It was fun. I'm looking forward to. It. I'm looking forward to next year. I mean, we go to Galley every year. I think next year I will probably go for the three days and just kind of go to a bunch of panels. They have good panels and they have good interviewers, which I've really liked. And a couple guys I know from that used to come to the comic shop when I owned it and are still around and have become teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. They do comic. They each did. They moderate a panel, one on comics and one on. Um, uh, Giant monster stuff. I forget the official term for Godzilla kind of movies. Kaiju, mm -hmm. Kaiju, I think it's mm. something like that. Yeah. Um, and they do panels, so I may go next year because they do it every year. It's fun. Um, but yeah, my about my kid really likes Kaiju. Does she? I don't know. I don't. Know. Oh no, then me and her can the bond because I, I like certain ones. I, I do. don't know the extent that she's seen them, but she was talking about them in depth the other day, and I was like. What? Okay. <laughs> That's cool. I, I own a few. I own the original. I got a box set with the original Godzilla in its Japanese edit and then the American mm -hmm. edit with uh, Raymond Burr inserted into these scenes. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a beautiful print. And watching the originals, oh, this is a much better movie without Raymond Burr. And I'm a big Raymond Burr fan. Mm -hmm. um, but I like these, uh, what they call the Monarch trilogy that started with a eh, okay Godzilla movie. But mm -hmm. they did um, Skull I Kong on Skull Island with Tom mm -hmm. Hiddleston and Samuel Jackson, and it was a great action movie. It was like the first time I really liked King Kong. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like if Apocalypse Now meets King Kong because it's set in the 70s. Um, mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed the rest of them because they're just you know they, you just have to give up on your imagination. It's right. a lot of spectacle. But the Japanese the 
the original King Kong, the first couple of King Kongs are good movies. They are good movies. It, it becomes, you know, we have to make it we have to make it faster and for less money. So it's just a dude in a new half-ass rubber suit fighting another huge dude in a stomping on um, city models. I remember a great um, uh, Mike Nesmith of the, of the Monkees did some mm -hmm. comedy videos in the '80s that were incredibly funny. One was called Ellen Parts. And he starts singing a song, and he's playing the guitar, and he's singing the song, and you start to realize about, eh, you know, a couple lines into it, he's singing about Godzilla, and the mm -hmm. camera pans down, and he's wearing these giant lizard legs, and he's stomping this model playing the guitar. It's also the one that he had, he did the, the parody of the old Marine Corps commercials, mm -hmm. we're looking for a few proud men, mm -hmm. and they did it as high camp. Mm -hmm very British high camp and it just made me pee because it was like, Oh my God, I think my father would find this funny. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, I'm going to start with recommendations. I think I've talked about Jeff Lemire before I, he was there. I got him to sign some stuff and me and Leslie watch. He did a comic strip called sweet tooth which was a post apocalyptic post pandemic. And he wrote it before the pandemic kind of, there's a pandemic and the world changes. And everybody, there's a, this, a, a flu that's going around that no one's immune to it. There's no way to have an immunity. Either you die quickly from it or you're, eventually everybody's going to die from it. But every ch but after it starts, every child born is a hybrid between a human and some sort of animal. And society just collapse. And the TV version, which is what I saw first, was kind of light. It's about... Gus, or Sweet Tooth, as everybody calls him because he likes sweets, has been raised in seclusion, and he's a hybrid. And the man who raised him as his father has died, and he's alone, and he leaves the woods. And he meets a man named Jenik, who's this, in the show, is this very large African-American gentleman who is a former football player in the real world. And they go on a journey, and the guy doesn't want to. And you know that he had been part of, like, the militias. Militias have formed, and he was one of them. And he doesn't want, he just wants to wander around, stay alive, and stay out of trouble. And he ends up having to help this kid. So it's a, it was a lighter touch on post-apocalyptic, because it was mm -hmm. like a father-son story. And, you know, you, I guess they wanted, they wanted kids to watch it, you know, teens mm -hmm. level. So they kind of mm -hmm. toned it down. And then I got the complete what they call compendiums now. They're like softback omnibuses, all 40 issues. And I started reading it and went, this makes The Last of Us seem like Chitty Chitty Bang. Mm -hmm. It is really a lot darker. The bad choices people make are a little more realistic because, they're, mm -hmm. you know, if it's the end of the world, people will make really bad decisions based on their own survival. But I really recommend both. They are two to, uh, because one, it's that thing about people, you know, I'm a, People go, well, you changed it. No, I reinterpreted it. That's what art does. Mm -hmm. Stop. It's not, oh, but you have to do it this way. No. You reinterpret it for the audience you're trying to hit. You reinterpret it for the medium that you're using. You reinterpret it, you know, where, you know, mm -hmm. so the first TV series came out during the pandemic. Tone it down. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're both great. But I highly recommend any of his comics. He, he did a a run on Green Lantern that I have in trade I haven't read. He did a run on Justice League that I enjoyed, me and about six people enjoyed. But he does a lot of his own stuff um, where he writes and draws it. He's got a very unique style. I like it. But then he does, you know, what I, I discovered him by reading something called Black Hammer, which was his love letter to Bronze Age comics. So, and I loved it. And I have all of it. So, um, and he created a whole universe. So I, re I really recommend it. Check out Jeff Lemire. And I'll, I'll, I'll post links. Let me ask you, have you seen, um, have you finished Last of Us? Yes. Um, what did you think of uh, Anna, uh, Ellie's mom? Oh, I love her. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I've always loved her. I've always loved her. She's brilliant, isn't she? She's amazing. And I keep forgetting she's the waitress in the Avengers. I know. No, she's so good. And that they freaking look alike. Yeah. They really, they, that's, that's a casting oh. director should have got a bonus because not only did you pick people that you believe no, no. she's her mother. Yes. They that was that, what they, it was. Is they cast Ellie because she looked like Ashley. Yes. Because Ashley so, was in. Ashley was the voice. Of Ellie. Was she the voice Ellie. of Ellie? Oh, okay. She, okay. She won a BAFTA for both video games. 
Very good. For Clay and Ellie. That's okay. Because there are a and lot she, of that. Like the guy that gets that Ellie puts the cleaver into the neck of was the original Joel. You're right. Yeah. And Troy Baker. Yeah. And the and Marlene was Marlene. Yeah. It was a really good show. I yeah. thought it was an incredibly. They're great together. I did see people going, you know, why didn't they talk about her agency? And it's like, and I talked to a, a, a guy at work who will not watch the show. He's played the game and he's and he's a vet. Right. right. And you know, so he avoids some violence, and I agree with it. Yeah. But I, someone goes, well, why didn't they show them have a discussion? And so that's not the point of the story. Right. In the last episode, he calls her baby girl. Mm-hmm. He's her father now. Mm-hmm. That is what the only thing that means. And it's a, and. and and I was talking, and I went, Ben, you and me don't have kids. And he, and I was like, I would have done the same thing. Mm-hmm. I would have killed every last one of them and gotten yeah. her out. Yeah. And someone goes, well, they would say, why he didn't need to kill everybody? He could have taught. No, they're going to come for her. Yeah. He's a father. A father. Yeah. And should he not kill? No, he shouldn't kill. But Joel's broken. Yeah, Everyone absolutely. in this world is broken. <clears throat> Right. And he has love. He feels love in his heart, and he's going to do anything to protect her. Mm-hmm. She's her. more important than, than the world. Yeah. You have a child. She's more important mm-hmm. than the world to you. Uh, well, yeah. So it just makes no. You know, that is the the only logical. These people, this abstract well, listen, argument. Here's here's the thing: is my child is more important than me. It's Joel. It's I mean, not just the world. Yeah. It's more important than me. Yeah. Right. As uh, like. The world could melt away and I might still exist, right? She's even, like, she surpasses that. Now, the other thing is, are you caught up on the uh, newest Picard? Yes. Did you catch Mika Burton? Yes, I did. Oh, I know she was in it the whole time because when the press came out, it was her that she's playing one of his two daughters. Was she great? I was wondering what she would do to be different than the actress playing her sister. Yeah. And you believe that they were sisters from moment one. Yeah. You really did. I'm loving yeah. this Picard season. And yeah, I think I Terry Metalis. See, I, Terry Metalis did the last, he was the producer of last season Enterprise, and it's the only mm-hmm. season Enterprise that they got right mm-hmm. because he really gets it. He knows what the fans want. Um, there's the Easter eggs for a nerd like me. It's like the, all the starships at the Fleet Museum, and mm-hmm. uh, that, and Metalis is such a dork that, and he's, you, and, I, there's a constitution class, it's, but sometime between Kirk and uh, uh, Pike's Enterprise, I guess is what they're saying, the New Jersey, mm-hmm. and that's in there because he's from New Jersey. As a good, as a good yeah. fe- person from New Jersey, we do. Yeah. New Jersey's going to get mentioned. But no, um, it's incredible. And the other two so seasons were Mika. Mika is also uh, has been on Critical Role. Uh, she had okay, a, yeah, yeah. a continuing character. Um, uh, who was great. Mika's a deep, deep D and D nerd, and um, and uh, so yeah, there've been two like outside of D and D pop culture experiences, you know, uh, recently um, by, by a couple people in Critical Role, and I will recommend um, if anybody is not for kids, um, but if anybody hasn't seen. Uh, the Adventures of or the Legend of Vox Machina on uh, Amazon Prime. It is adult cartoon, um, and it is um, the character of Pike um, is uh, created by, not just voiced by, but the character's actions were created by Ashley Johnson, who played Ellie in the original Last of Us, and um, she played Patterson in the, the Crime, X Files, the sort of blind spot TV show. And oh yeah, 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 yeah. She was the she was the person that would run down everything and. She's the computer nerd, right? Yeah, yeah. She's the she's the, the, the Patterson. Yeah. yeah, she's. she's and she was great in that. I mean, she's a good in everything I see her in, and I forget but, it's her, which is a good thing for an actor. It's a great Whoa. thing. Oh, right. Wait a minute. Oh. Right. So well, and I mean, that she scene, started that out scene on then. Who's the Boss, not Who's the Boss, but Facts of Life. No, she's not that old. No, it's the um, Kirk Cameron one. Oh, yeah. She's like, they need another little kid. The baby. Yeah. There was a baby, and then the next year, the kid's four. And, and they went sh- to their room. It's the old soap opera thing. It's like, yeah. when you need the teenager to become an adult so you can have them have sex, they yeah. go to their room for six weeks and come back yeah. down and, whoa, what happened but, up there? <laughs> but um, so she's been acting for, 
for that long. She was on that. She was a four year old on that TV show. And she's been in it. She's been in the Avengers movie. She's been. And she's wonderful in she everything she does. But she creates the character of Pike Trickfoot. Um, uh, and Ashley may be my favorite person um, other than the DM. Um, in that, but it's a wonderful animation. It's I'll just check not. That out. It, check it's that not out. for kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, season two is up. The um, uh, Mika is uh, may be present in. Uh, they've gotten greenlit for their second series, um, which is uh, uh, not Vox Machina, and I'm now I've just blanked on it. But it was campaign two. Um, has also been greenlit for a multi-series, um, a multi-series animated show um, for Amazon Prime, and uh, it is improv, right? Oh, that's just cool. like everything at it. Well, but just no. What happens is, what has happened is, they played their characters live. Right? They played their characters. They create their characters. They play their characters. And the DM puts them through um, uh, adventures. But the characters, the dialogue, all of it has been, the, and the entire story is improvised at the Dungeons and Dragons table. They then work with writers to be able to move the story forward, but all of the original players are voicing the characters that they created. Wow. So anything that the characters do um, was improvised at the table originally. And so it's a fantastic, fantastic experience of watching people build characters in real time. It's fantastic. That and uh, I read a, uh, the other thing I'll recommend is a um, book that I just finished uh, called The Alphabet House by Jussi Adler Olsen. Uh, is he Swedish? Danish. Um, and uh, these things, uh, it was written in 1997. It's fantastic. Um, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, when my community and my life um, are the targets of uh, threats, and I have to start planning um, escape routes, um, and I have to live under the type of stress that I'm currently living under, um, trying to figure out how to run an underground railroad for um, families with transgender children. Um, I usually uh, watch, read, listen to um, World War II books because uh, there were people, everybody pretends like they were on the, on the same side. Uh, during World War II, everybody everybody knows who were the bad guys and who were the good guys, and uh, so I am deep into World War II. But this one is a very interesting, um, very interesting. These two pilots um, are on a bombing, or uh, I guess on a on a reconnaissance flight um, to plan bombing raids, and their plane crashes, and they. Uh, find themselves uh, in trying to escape. They jump a train. The train is full of injured and dying um, SS officers. Um, and they uh, take the place of two SS officers who have died on the, um, and uh, they wind, because they don't speak, um, they uh, wind up in a mental ward. Um, so they're, they're British pilots who wind up having to fake insanity to stay alive. Yeah. Wow. Fucked up. <laughs> and so it's great. It's fantastic. It's called Alphabet City? Uh, Alphabet House. Alphabet House. Because they, um, they're, uh, the Nazi hospital system gave people, uh, combinations of letters and numbers to tell them, you know, what state this person was in, 
you know, so that they could move them between different states? Would, would they be fully functional and able to go back into combat or what? And so they were just all given these jumble of numbers and or num- letters. And so that's the room, the place that they were in was called the alphabet house because there were just so many letters being applied to different people. So yeah, it's a fascinating, real. fascinating book. Um, Is it? Pure fiction? Is it pure fiction? Like, yes. Okay, it's not, okay. Very cool. Pure, well, I mean, it's pure fiction other than the fact that... Those places they, existed. Existed, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And that SS officers were treated differently and treated maybe a little bit better. And, yeah, yeah. Right. So, pieces of shit. <laughs> like I said, mm-hmm. there's an awful lot of similarities right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we're having to... Here's the thing that I'll tell you is that my wife has been saying for years because she's paranoid um, that we've given uh, our enemies a registry. They don't have to make one up because we all ran out and got married. And uh, Texas, they've now um, they're requiring their motor vehicles division to turn over lists of everyone who applied for a change of gender assignment. And so um, it's not fiction, and it's not paranoia. It's actually happening. So we we have are putting contingency plans in place. So for anybody who thinks that this is just nonsense, be aware that in the United States, you know, uh, upper middle class families with uh, high school age children who do such incredibly harmful things like Doctor Who podcasts um, and play Dungeons and Dragons on the weekends um, are having to um, put contingency plans in place for what to do with their property and assets and for their physical safety. This isn't fiction. Yeah. No, every day it's worse and worse. Everything in the news is worse and worse. It's just... Mm-hmm. And that they, you know, that they just right. are doing it without with impunity. And that one section, one of our parties is gerrymandered things so much to where they can have super majorities, even when they don't have a plurality of voters in some places. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, Florida is like, I've always thought it was a shithole. Now it's just proving me right. Mm-hmm. Well, in Tennessee's governor, Bill D is is looking like either a top um, contender uh, against DeSantis or a running mate. Jesus. And, He's uh, just as bad. I mean, he hasn't banned, but, right, but even in um, the more liberal county adjacent to mine, Montgomery County, Maryland, um, uh, they read a book about uh, going to a little, it was about a little girl, it's called My Uncle's Wedding, and she went to the wedding of her two uncles, right? Like, and, um, and parents are flipping out that it was read in her third grade classroom or whatever. And um, it's not about indoctrinating your child into becoming gay. It's about preventing them from bullying the gay kid in their classroom because books like that were read in my child's classroom when other students had commented about her family and expressed either disbelief or right, they, they would read books like that to normalize my child's family. So you can say, I don't care that you exist or whatever. I just don't want this. Well, it, this is about my existence. It's not about your child or turning your child into anything other than a decent human being. So we are um, in a very rough place right yeah. now. And, uh, you know, I have always had that um, quote up that first they came for the communists, right? Yeah. They're going to come for us first. And then they'll come for you. So the U.S. is in a very bad place right now. I mean, it's been in a bad place for a while, but we haven't been making these plans until recently. Yeah. So. All right, folks. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday, yeah. Um, But, folks, hey, until next time, 
We look forward to seeing you somewhere in time or space. Thank you.